mean, that's what happens with uh with live. Yeah, I figured probably my kids touched something and something went wrong. Okay, okay. So with patience and per perseverance, it happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to meet you. I'm good. I'm good. Is it I know. We've been trying to connect for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's quite hot here in Jamaica. I think there's a wave of Saharan dust coming over, so it's a bit windy as well. Oh, but my gosh. I think it's a bit humid. <laughs> Yeah, same here. I'm um, I'm in Italy, so it's I don't know. It's, Italy's a lot like Jamaica, where we don't have a lot of AC. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm 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 locked in a room with AC today because the heat was too much. But yeah. I'm really <laughs> excited <laughs> to um to talk with you because, as I was telling before, for many reasons, but I don't get to meet a lot of women of color. Mm -hmm. um in the in the marine or aquaculture space especially aquaculture there's a lot of women of color in marine but fish farming is something that when i went to school in florida i was always the only one at every conference every in my career so i'm really yeah. interested in meeting other women of color in jamaica and the caribbean who are now coming up into this space because it's a very to me, it's a very important field that I think has gotten the sideline a lot. Mm -hmm. And That's it's true. something that aquaculture and promoting aquatic foods is something that mm -hmm. I think, especially for the Caribbean region, we have to now start talking about a lot more, especially because of overfishing. Right. We've heard so much about overfishing and 40% of the species, or probably more, has been overfished in the Caribbean region what mm -hmm. are the solutions what are the solutions for um fish for for fish fishermen right or for the region we need to have um other types of foods not just poultry and beef but fish right so i yeah. i saw that you you know you manage your own um this farm that in your bio says that you are trying to use fishing inland fishing as a way to maybe one solution to you know overcome fishing in our seas so i'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and your career oh okay all right so um my name is nashika gaya for everyone um hello morning as again um boy when you asked me this morning i must say something about myself i literally had to get a notepad <laughs> uh, so I'm a marine biologist as well as an entrepreneur. Um, I am the only larval fish taxonomist in Jamaica. I'm not sure about wow. the Caribbean. I am work, uh, currently work well. I've completed my PhD, so it's in the correcting phase now. Um, oh, congratulations. Um, That's yeah. fantastic. Where are you doing your PhD? I'm doing a PhD in monitoring. I'm doing it here. Um, so I'm promoting, no, sorry, developing monitoring protocols for MPAs in Jamaica. So I'm trying to find cheaper ways of um, doing fish assessments and still getting um, that quality information that we that we need. So I do um, larval fish assessments, which is that, which are not considered when doing um, assessing coastal areas to promote um, to establish. Uh, Marine protected areas. Please forgive me. I'm a little nervous right now. No, we're just chatting. I'm All just right. fascinated. I, I love to hear about these things. Yeah, and also I'm developing a baited camera protocol where we will just literally develop. I have developed a camera system. I'll share a picture with you later. I developed a camera system, attach bait to it, and then try to find simple ways of um, like a layman can come and actually there's a little uh, manual that shows him how to measure fish. That's one of the critical things in uh, establishing an MPA, measuring yeah. fish as well, identifying fish as well. Okay, so, that's great. Yeah. 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 And uh, one of the problems is that in Jamaica, we, we, we don't have much resources, so we have to really use what we have available and um, yeah. the knowledge that we have available as well. So I'm, that's why I'm trying to find cost-effective methods 
um, in order that that can be used throughout our MPAs or or used to con used to establish uh, MPAs as well. What is an MPA? So uh, MPA is a marine protected area in Jamaica. It's also known as a special fishery conservation area, um, or a fish reserve or marine reserve. Okay, okay. For the people who are listening. Oh, yes. <laughs> Right. So, so now that they'll be able to use a camera to actually um, measure the fish, so they know. Okay, they they know what small is, but this yeah. way you can really have the proper data to know what's coming in using that camera. Correct. No, that's that's really gr that's great. So, congratulations. And I'm trying to that. It, it, thanks. I'm trying to design it in such a way that it's more applicable to um, fish farmers. So instead of using a, a a net to just throw and catch just a sample of your your fish your your small even three or four um, inch fish, we can actually just put down a camera with a little bait on it, and then they actually come to the camera. You just take a screenshot, and you can actually have um, a measurement of of uh, a little sample measurement of what what's going on in your pond. Okay, so Matt James is asking if I don't know if you know how many MPAs are there in Jamaica. Do you have any idea? Um, we can not... answer after. <laughs> Morning, Matt. Um, so far I think it's a 14, 14 and growing. Oh wow! Yeah. So that's Around that's there. encouraging. So, um, yeah. is there a connection? Do you, do you know if there's a connection between these MPAs and the community? Is the community really? Uh, involved or are these isolated uh, fish sanctuaries? No, they're all attached. Well, they're close by to fishing communities. The only one that's um, uh, that's not really attached is an offshore one. I think is Southwest Key. That's out by Pedro Banks. Okay, okay. Yeah, but most of them they're they're relatively close to um fishing communities. So, how did you get into marine biology? Onto your doing your PhD. Well, it started from I was a young, a really young girl. So I would say around six years old. Um, my dad used to carry us out to the keys on the south coast, like Pelican Keys or Needles or like Manatee Bay, Cocoa Bay. It's just like our Sunday fun day kind of kind of excursion. And um, from an early age, I learned how to snorkel. So I would go and just like looking at the coral reefs. I'm just looking at the fish. But then, like, at an early age, I could realize, hey, what we're getting on our plate and what I'm seeing is not really adding up, you know? Yeah, is this yeah. just, like, little fish? And this was, like, yeah. 15 years ago or so. I don't want to say my yeah. age. I'm, I'm, I'm young at heart. Um, <laughs> yeah. So from then, my, my mind was kind of geared towards um, learning more about the marine life, learning more about coral reefs, and how can I help and how can I protect because I remember one of my turning points in, in life was that I was out there one day, one Sunday, and I saw a fisherman, he was passing by, and they were hailing us up, and then he just, he held up a turtle. He got a no. turtle. No, no, right. oh, no. And then that same day, I actually was snorkeling around the key, and I saw a turtle shell, as in a, a hawksbill turtle shell, was there in the water, like it was freshly killed and, and gutted. So I was like, oh. it kind of broke my heart at that point. And then from then, I kind of select my subjects in school geared towards biology. And when I got okay. fed up, actually, I, I did better at biology than any other subject. <laughs> so it was like closing for me. So Yeah, you go, you go with your passion. You go what, what you know, feels yeah. the best. So, right. I mean, and in sciences, I mean, for us, I know in the States, everything is STEM. But for us, sciences yeah. was a science, right? You just, if that's what you wanted to do, you went into the sciences. Well, yes, but from an early age, I also learned about STEM because my dad is an engineer by heart. So he taught me to make, uh, he taught me to make magic out of little parts, really. Okay. Um, couple of pipes, put them together, you make a quadrat. So okay. stuff like that. <laughs> so stuff like that. So when I entered university, um, I realized I was really good at biology. Like, uh, even my, my professor, Dr. Um, professor Mona Webber, she kind of helped me as, as well go along. Um, and I really enjoyed it because in university, in our final year, 
we actually get to go out to sea, we get to snorkel, we get to dive, we get to go into the mangrove forest. We do the learn we we are learned uh we are learned all the different methods of, of assessing the coastal systems and we got to be more aware of um how development affected our systems and stuff like that. So it really opened my eye in seeing our what our natural resources and um the impact on our natural resources and the little things that we do every day actually um influence what happens to the environment. Absolutely. So how did you um segue into the farm? Tell us about All the right. farm. So my dad bought a farm in about 1996. I think I was about seven years old. And um, every weekend we'll go, if we're not going to see, we're going to the farm. So it was, the both of them was there hand in hand, more or less. Um, so I was on the farm from that age, he taught me how to fish. Um, he al always had a, a saying, um, teach a man how to fish and he knows to feed himself. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So he taught me how to fish, and uh, I've been learning about the business since then. Like I would go in the pond with them when they're pulling the net. Uh, I'll be in the mud playing. I'll be either rowing a boat or something of the sort. I, will, I was always active on the farm. And then um, at, I think it was 2008, there was a recession, and then uh, we kind of closed the business down. But since then, the farm was his avenue of entertainment, his avenue of enjoying himself and relaxing. Because he planted coconut trees, a lot of trees, fruit trees, and he would just go down there after a hard week at work yeah. and just relax. literally just, just... I think I've been there. <laughs> I think I've been there. <laughs> I remember, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to, but I think I've... I've yeah, uh-huh. Because I remember the coconut yeah, trees. Been, we've been... We had it since uh, 1996. Yeah, that's a couple of years now. Um, so, yeah. So, it's a really relaxing environment. He created this relaxing environment for himself. And then... The business started where his friends would always come, or our family. We have a big family, so they would always come over, and we'll catch fish, we we'll cook it, and they say, "Hey, why not make this into a business?" So right. this, we started it. Well, not we, him at that time. We started it. My brother was the one in charge at that time. Um, started the business. Um, people would come, the fish, you get the fish cooked because my dad is a really good chef as well. So. Um, you get your fish cooked, you get festival, you sit down on the nice little um, hut and you have your fish and you're watching the waves and it is just it's just like a wonderful experience. That experience yeah. from, right, like, even at that age. And then um, the recession came, we closed, we, we had to close doors because the, the economy was, it was going haywire really. Right. Um, and at that time I was still in school and um, I was transitioning into, I think, what age was it? Yeah, I was transitioning to, uh, to university at that time. Um, and then when I finished university, that was in 2011, he decided to say, all right, I have, I have more help now. And he, uh, he approached me, would you like to um, learn more about the business? And I, I went ahead because at that time I was a bit unsure of what avenue I wanted to take. If I wanted to continue sciences or, um, or if I wanted to go into um, the business. Um, as soon as I accepted going into the business, I got through from a master's program here at oh, University wow. of West Indies. So I was like trying to balance both of them. So the first couple of years, since 2011, I was learning more about fish farming and then applying what I learned in university. Because uni in the university, we learned about aquaculture and um, the different farms, the pinnate shrimp. We learned more about tilapia. We learned about uh, the carp. So I was trying to find ways of how I can apply all what I've learned at school in our business. Right. So, right. Yeah. And then we just, I just continued to do, do the business. Um, people came from all over Jamaica, all over the world, actually. They would come down on a Sunday or a Saturday or on the weekends. They fish, we get the fish cooked for them, and they sit down and they enjoy themselves. And, that, and I think that's... That, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about down there. They, they, they fell in love with the environment just as how I did and that's right. how my mother did. So it just literally, it was just a relaxing, stress-free environment created by simple ponds and simple trees. So I was like, so I was, I've been in business a while and I was like, uh, I wanted to learn more about marketing, what's the growth strategy, um, Finances, how, how, how do I take... aspect of it. Yeah, yeah you're taking the production now, 
and learning the business is a whole different uh, part of it. Right. And that's how um, I learned about the Blue Economy Program from the Branson Center of the Caribbean. And okay. then, yeah, so and then we got chosen for it because their initiative at that time with Blue Economy tied well with the farm and what yeah. we were. Uh, yeah. Of the I, so I want to go back. Was, uh, I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that. But before we get to the Branson, which is fascinating, uh, I want to talk about pr the production aspect of it. So, right. um, how hard was it? How, how how hard was it for you to learn about aquaculture? And what's special about your farm? Are you currently doing saltwater tilapia or freshwater right. tilapia? So based on the location of the farm, we're about a few miles from Galleon Harbor. So the our water source is um, Salt Island Creek. We, it's actually brackish water. So we have a salt water influx coming up from Galleon Harbor. And um, we get, so that's how we, our ponds are half salt, half fresh. So I realized that this actually gave our tilapia a different taste from everybody else. And that's one of my promoting things. When everybody comes to the farm, oh, I don't eat tilapia. It's muddy. It's this. It's that. I was like, listen, I'll give you a fish free. I'll cook it for you. Try it. And I've got them hooked since then. So this has a, yeah, it has so a sweeter taste and it looks different because it's a red tilapia. So they look more like yeah. marine fish. Right. So right. it doesn't look like fresh water. It looks more... And Jamaicans love, um, we traditionally okay. love marine fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Jamaica is more about marine fish, but um, the difference with ores is that the taste, the taste is totally different from the regular tilapia. Um and I think it's a, I, I don't want to say, but I think it's a salt, let me just move spaces. No, it, it, it would have, it would have a difference in, um, it would have a difference in the taste and it would, and, and then the look makes a difference also, right? Because right. one of the things that you talked about was, um, trying to use that as one of the solutions to fishing in our open waters, because we are always trying to find a solution. What solution can there be? So um, how, hard is it, how hard do you think it would be for a beginner to start a fish pond and saltwater fish pond? Is there a space for that, for other people to come and help you or to work or to learn? Or what, what do you think? Um, the ease of setting up uh, saltwater fish pond. All right. So first, it really depends on where you have your property. Once you have um, an ease of access to, say, brackish water, um, it would be relatively easier for you. But to, to, some people ask me if we add salt to the water. We don't add salt to the water. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. That would be hard yeah. to do. That would be very hard yeah. to do. All right. So once you have the uh, an ideal location located close either to the sea where you can get some uh, pump some salt water in, um, once you have a good water supply, it's pretty easy. And then and if you have the the capital as well to to dig a pond because if you're going in in fish farming, you can't go small. It 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 doesn't make sense. You go small. You have to go big or go home. Right. Um, right. Especially in Jamaica, you have to you have to go big because you have to be able to supply, and then um, things are cheaper in bulk. You you see you you and also you see your profit when you sell in bulk, really. Right. So if you have a, right. if you have a small pond and all your profit is ten percent, ten percent maybe a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. When you have a ten percent of a bigger pond, you'll see more money, and that's what Jamaicans, well, not Jamaicans, that's what a lot of people look at. How much money can I get from this? Absolutely, because it's a, like you said, it's a business. So, yeah. um, so what about? Okay, so we know the positives. We need to have more. What are some of the negatives? What are some of the hard things about fish farming in Jamaica? Um. Why it it Energy. is not until but it's not until recently our our mini store actually has shed some light on fish farmers. Um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, we were basically in the back, like, like we were in the background, like, hey, yeah, you guys are right, people. right, right. Our minister of here, he's actually pumping into pumping in in the sector, um, and we learn it there. People are learning more and more, more and more about um, fish farming, and the importance. Everybody saw the importance of it last year when COVID hit. Nobody was allowed to go to sea and catch fish or anything. Mm -hmm. So they had to rely. They, there was a boom in the industry last year. Um, they had to rely on inland fisheries in, in order to supply um, fish. So, so that's what I heard from Mr. Bunting. He, that's what he said, that business really went up. And so that's something to capitalize on for the industry yeah. to continue. Yeah, since then people have been um, calling, where can I get small fish from? Um, how do I start a pond? How do I build a pond? Uh, I said, well, this is just like a, a, a fish farm and a restaurant. Uh, you'd have to ask for shoes. But, um, right. So the, if anybody wants to know about this, they, they need to go to the to NFA, the National Fisheries Association, to learn no, about. There's actually the aquaculture division located in Spanish Town. There's an the aquaculture division. And they have terrific officers there. They will assist you in any way you want. So the, the, we have the facility already here in place to, to assist farmers. They come to your farm. They tell you, well, are you, if you're feeding enough or not. Um, they help you calculate it, you, how much pond area you need, how much fish you need to start the ponds. And they supply the, the, the fingerlings as well. So we okay. have already have the infrastructure. So, oh, so they supply, what about the saltwater fingerlings? Are you able to get that? No, or? actually what happened is that we, we don't use, it's essentially the same tilapia that we use from fisheries, um, from the aquaculture division, and then we acclimatize them to our water. So the oh. same, same freshwater fish, same tilapia, red tilapia, but we just acclimatize them to our conditions. So it takes a little time, so we have to gradually in, gradually um increase them that's to the, the yeah okay okay oh that's fantastic yeah. so feed what about feed um what's accessibility for feed well with regards to feed we only have one supplier um if you don't import it like me i know mr bunting imports his feed um but if you don't have the capital to import feed you would have to get it um from one supplier here and it has been a bit of a challenge, I must say, um, in terms of quantity that you can get and as well as the quality. Um, the protein content is, it, 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 it varies in all honesty. Um, right. And sometimes you can't get fish feed, you would have to use an alternative. Uh, I know a lot of persons use chicken feed at times. And then, oh. in this, yeah, so it, it, it's touch and it's touch and go sometime when it comes to feed as with quantity and quality um as well it the cost of it is actually going up like a couple of years ago you could get a bag for about 1500 jamaican now it's gone to about 2300 depending on where you are the closer right. you are to the factory it will be cheaper because if you're buying it from somebody else but people right. that are located far where the middleman has to make his money on yeah. it so it's more expensive so when we so talk we about, about innovation more. i mean so i'm really happy to hear that aquaculture is um giving that boost from the government end and so i also is it, i think the next step that we need is like more innovation right like like right. you said you talk about a feed we have to look at how can you use maybe local ingredients to make feed and what about the energy? I think that's where we have more room to grow for more yeah. uh, people to get into science and research and innovation. Yeah. I think that's yeah. where we really need to broaden the, uh, the um, field. So, yeah. so no, that's, that's pretty exciting to hear that that is really um, coming along. So now you got into the Branson Center. So tell me about the Branson Center. That's that's really exciting that that got that, you know, aquaculture got that spotlight into business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So with regards to the Branson, I was so excited when I got accepted into their program. Um what what was the the highlight of the business was that in order for persons to accept um tilapia uh, as a as a food fish, I had to bring them down to the bring literally draw them to the farm. 
when they come to the farm, um, we promote ecotourism, promote sustainability, uh, explain to them, well, um, our marine resources are under pressure and we need to like eat what we grow, grow what we eat, basically. And um, that's, that's, the line, that's, that's, what a, that's what the Branson Center was really attracted to our concept. And then in order, one of the growth strategy for our farm was to introduce um, ecotours. So where our farm is located, we actually have access to um, Galleon Harbour. So we were going to incorporate boat tours as well. And um, that's where the Branson Center came in to kind of help me narrow down our business strategy and, and um, get me more focused on financials and stuff like that. But it is, trust me, it opened my eyes to the, the business world and I'm, I'm loving it. But at the right. same time, as soon as we got, got into the program, COVID hit. So we had um, to change from like face to face, um, face to face uh, meetings to more online meetings, and right. it kind of slowed. It slowed our progress a bit, but it didn't right. stop us. No, absolutely not. Because I think that's one of the things I talked about with Mr. Bunting was that um, bringing fish farming up to making it a very serious business, you have to start looking at record keeping. Um, you know, finances, accounting. I think I missed, I, I lost you there a second. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I, I was telling you that I um, spoke to Mr. Bunting and he was telling me that, you know, um, record keeping is something that really needs to be taken more seriously in the business aspect of it. Um, the money aspect, actually knowing how much you're spending um, how much you're selling versus how much you're spending. So for farmers to really start taking that more seriously um, yeah. and to be able and do more business classes. So they may know about the production, but more business, marketing, PR, um, do they use social media? What about branding? <laughs> Things like that. I think that's the yeah. next stage to bring to let people be more aware about uh, fish farming and to understand, yeah. to, like you said, that you had to still educate people about tilapia. Um, yeah. How many people like to eat tilapia or what is the perception of tilapia? Um, the sustain, sustainability aspect about it. So I think if more farmers start using social media and coming online to promote uh, what is happening, it will get mm -hmm. more attention. Yeah, and that's so true because when I did my interviews with different farmers um, for the consultancy, um, nobody really used uh, social media. Nobody has their marketing strategy. They say, hey, um, Higlos come on the farm and they just take everything and then that's it. So, right. there, yeah, there's no calculation. They sell out, they sell out everything, but there's they sell no... They everything like, and starts again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they don't, know, they don't know what they're putting in. The, they don't know what they're putting in the yeah. pond. They don't know what's in the pond. What, what, how much feed you're using? So there, I mean, there needs to be record keeping about right. every single thing along the way to have a better yeah. understanding of where you're, where you are, and yeah. how, what you need to move forward to actually make more money. Yeah. Yeah, and I must say, Mr. Bunting has his his, his books in in order. Uh, um, he's my good friend. He has his books in order. He has he trust me. He he knows yes. this stuff. Yes, and that's what he's trying to promote. And um, yes. I think that's something that we should promote to the farmers. Is that business? The biz It's a business, and it's a business. Uh, we need to take it to the next level. And in order for more people to take it seriously, and not just something that you sell on the side of the road. It's a it's yeah. a business that's very important and very vital to food security. Right. I mean, right. like you said, COVID is something that really uh, put forward how much Jamaica needs to start really producing its own food, and it has the capability of producing mm -hmm. its own food. It's just we need to take it up a notch and take it more seriously. 
Yeah. So yeah, during COVID, we had to we had to re-strategize. Uh, so we couldn't have people coming onto the farm. So we parceled up. We parceled up fish. We took took orders and we did our deliveries out to persons. Um, we had um crop production as well. So we we joined fish crop. We do um pigs as well. So we do it. We did a nice little basket. And, and and delivered out to persons who ordered and so that's how we had to restrategize especially with covid and that's marketing that's marketing and yeah. branding that's yeah. excellent that's that's exciting yeah so we had to they couldn't come down so we had to give we had to make sure that they got it so um right. and that's what i must say branson the branson program taught me so so much so much it, like i appreciate the knowledge that they've gave that have given me on you know honestly right right so no so this is exciting to know you're doing your phd and you have the business so <laughs> so you're what is your what is your hope for the future yeah so i was doing the business on the phd at the same time i did my phd in discover bay um sfcs um marine reserve and um it was a lot of diving so i'd be I would, I would be micromanaging the farm in the week and then down on the farm on the weekend for the restaurant, as, the recreational aspect of it where people would come on. Um, but operations, I was able to micromanage and my dad and my brother helped me a lot um, as well. Um, but yeah, I had to learn to balance everything now that I'm finished the PhD. I'm writing writing papers as well as um, re-strategizing re to open back the recreational facility at the farm to and taking bearing in mind the COVID regulations and stuff. So it, it, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot, but with help, right? With yeah. help. That's, that's about managing, like strategizing and um, getting other people to fill in the gaps. Um, yeah. What advice, do you have any advice for women? I mean, like, are, are there other, do you see other women in the space? like more women to but get I, in the space i think i can count on one hand how many women are actually in fish farming i know of two women on the south coast there could be more but i've only met two i've heard of more persons there but um it's a it's it's a male dominated world um fish farming and one of the challenges that there as a woman you're not really your opinions aren't really considered because, hey, uh, I've been in this business a long time and you're just coming in. And but I've I've learned the theory of it. I've been in it since I was young. Um, what I can do is I always give women advice. Like I've I've gotten a lot of calls from females. How do I start this business and how do how do I sell tilapia? So I've gotten a calls, gotten calls from a lot of ladies that are wholesalers. Um, with regards to, to selling tilapia and I'll say, hey, pre what people love a good packaging. So I try to give them business ideas. I could yes, use these ideas me. myself. Yeah, right. pre packaging yeah. make it look like a nice presentation. Mm -hmm. Social media is there. Take a nice picture, advertise your thing. And you get calls. It's all about mm -hmm. packaging at times, how you market it, how you brand your thing, as you said. And people are doing this with chicken, with sausage, with everything, but you hardly see it being done with, with tilapia. Fish. Right, right. And it's like and a I business idea really, for anybody out there. How you man how yeah. you market how you market your fish is is, is um the tilapia. Uh it it has a lot to do with how successful it is. Yeah, I think no they need to take it to that level where they have to um fall in line with social media, fall in line with Facebook, um marketing yeah. that's all a part of marketing and, and branding. And yeah. for me I think um for women to get into the space is, is great because it, having your own business as an entrepreneur is really important, especially if you have kids. Because yes. then you have you you can manage your own time and your own, uh, you know, you can work for yourself. So yeah. that's something I, I look forward to more women being in the space. But you're you are a pinnacle and you are now yeah. the role model because <laughs> yeah. you're, so doing, that's, you're doing that's it that's you're that's the next challenge it. balancing everything uh, along with motherhood so i have two kids and i have to be balancing their well-being as like i have to make sure that they're okay before any business absolutely. at all absolutely you know? absolutely and to know so, that uh, to know that it's um uh, if you have things in place and you need your support group 
if you have your support mm -hmm. group and your support system, um, you can yeah, put your children first. You have yeah. your studies, which will be over soon. And yeah. then you can uh, manage your business. So it's just to take put, put things into parcels. And yeah. having that support group and community is really important for women. Yeah. yeah. But, so the, you, you know, honestly, the industry is really challenging for, for women, especially in Jamaica. It's, I think it's like 99% male farmers, fish farmers. Um, but uh, it, it, we're, we're, we're pushing. We're pushing through. Yeah, pushing I think once, once, you cheat, once more women get into the space, more scientists, we need more scientists um, to understand. Because also, it's like, okay, you study aquaculture, what are you going to do with it when you're finished? Right. So I think that's also the issue, like, what can you do with it? But there's more to it. Uh, like I said, we need there's innovators. More. There's mm -hmm. a lot more. So I hope that we can be a voice for getting more women into the space and, you know, not, yeah, more it's, entrepreneurs. It's not, yeah. Um, I had, well, couple, I, did, I think I did tours about six years straight, Um, the aquaculture class at University wow. of West Indies. Yeah, we've been, uh, the tour, they we invite them down on the tours and we tour the farm i give the a lecture down there about tilapia and farming fantastic. in jamaica and stuff like yeah oh, fantastic. so that's we're exciting. pushing public education as well from our farm that's exciting no that's great yeah. <laughs> so we also tell them about we do uh, acclimatization experiments like we try to in uh incorporate other species such as snook like a lot of persons like that's snook easy. and tarpons yeah, so oh, wow. since we, the advantage of having the brackish water is that we can have these species as well. And, um, and it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new world for them to, to learn about snook and, and tarpon and tilapia, everybody coexisting. And um, we also have colosuma uh, as well as grass carp. So we have different kinds of fish down there. And uh, we, I showed them the different ones, and it, 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 it is, it's a nice variety from the red tilapia because every aquaculture farm is red tilapia. tilapia. Um, yeah, so I also showed them other species that can be um, grown in ponds as well. Oh, this is so exciting. I, didn't, I had no idea. I learned, I learned so much from you today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so. So, no, so thank you so much for no coming on and telling us about your business. I mean, it's a lot. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah so a lot. I look forward <laughs> to seeing it on your social media page. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm still learning about Instagram. I've, I've been out of it so long. I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> but Facebook, you're on Facebook though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, at least it's one, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to push social media, but um, I've taken but a everybody, little... It's word of mouth in Jamaica already, so everybody knows yeah. about your farm. So it's mainly yeah. for people who visit us or foreigners who never uh, have been there. Yeah, and uh, well, I try to push. We have a lot of Google reviews um other than oh. facebook so we try to be on google and then we set up on instagram but because um i just I've, I've taken a little step back from the limelight uh, since i had my kids so hopefully and then covid came so hopefully by the end of the year we'll be up and running currently we're down out for renovations um mm -hmm. we're in the middle of renovations when covid hit so we're kind of kind of re-strategizing um, we started marketing back with the, the fish, but the recreational mm -hmm. aspect of it, will, which is inviting persons down to fish. And I, I did not realize how much an impact um, the simple act of fishing with like a family member, a lot of persons, mm -hmm. I want to teach my son how to fish. I want to teach my daughter how to fish. And this is the only place that, that you can go and do it. You can it. So, go and do it, yeah. Yeah, so That's I've identified that gap now and I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to push push to make it a, a reality again that sounds so incredible <laughs> i can't yeah. wait to come down and visit again <laughs> no problem whenever you're ready so it was really nice talking with you and if you remember anything you want to put in the comments or you know any uh site that you're asked for facebook i'm gonna i'm gonna post this and then you can comment on it so it was re i'm really happy to have met you and Finally, we get to talk. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, have a nice day. All right, you too. Take care. Bye. Bye.